All right, hello and good afternoon. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be in uh, North America or the world. I'm Tad Bradley, one of the North American sales reps for Ultimate Safaris in Namibia. And today we are going to uh, dive deep into Namibia again with our fourth installment of our Namibia Deep Dive webinar series. Um, this Today we're going to be looking at, dis at Damarland and discovering Damarland, which um, personally and I feel is the, the heart and soul of any good Namibian safari, um, the home of some incredible conservation stories, um, as well as uh, amazing landscapes and very unique desert adapted creatures. As usual, I am joined by Birgit Becker, the incredible sales and marketing director of Ultimate Safaris, and she's gonna join us live from Bintook. Just a few housekeeping things before I hand it over to Birgit. Uh, if you have questions, we will be answering those at the end, so you can feel free to enter your questions into the chat or Q&A panel on your control panel. We're also recording this webinar, so if you have to step away, we um, will send out a link to it and you can watch it in its entirety at a later date or share it with your um, colleagues. And it also will be archived on the Cassini Collections uh, YouTube channel and our playlist of these uh, Namibia Deep Dive webinars. So don't fret if you miss any of uh, Birgit's amazing presentation on my favorite part of Namibia. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Birgit um, over in, in uh, Vintook and let her take us uh, on an amazing tour of Northwest Namibia and Damarland. Birgit, over to you. Hello, hello, hello everybody. Yes, indeed, it is a personal favorite place of mine as well. Um, just to explain a little bit that Tad is my wingman and he's actually running with the presentation while I'm doing the talking. It's due to Namibian internet being dodgy in the best of days. So there's a quite a long lag. So if I sometimes hesitate between slides or something, it just means I'm waiting for slides to catch up. I think we'll get the team just right. But yes, let's dig into the fav my favorite place in Namibia, the Dummer Land. There's always a question about why Dummer Land. Everybody goes on about Sausage Flame, Tosha. And a lot of operators, I notice, give Dummerland a night just to see the 12 of 10 rock engravings. But there is so much to see to this. I remember the first time I went to the Dummerland was in the mid-90s. I worked with Wilderness Safaris that time, and we just opened the Dummerland camp. I have to admit, I was in my mid-20s, so I was more interested in parties and boyfriends. So I didn't think that spending a weekend in some desolate, rocky desert will in any way inspire me. And I'll tell you, after many hours driving around this beautiful scenery, but still driving around in this old Land Rover and not seeing anything but donkeys, I was getting worried. Oh my goodness, wilderness has just made a missed investment. Who's going to travel thousands of miles to see a few donkeys? Yes, the scenery is stunning, but phew, where's the animals? And that same weekend, we then met the Conservancy Joint Venture leaders, and they told us, you just bring the tourist, we take care of the wildlife. You just wait. They were so excited because we just initiated this joint venture initiative where the communities benefit from various initiatives in the land where many of them have been forcefully relocated. And one of them is tourism, where with communicating together with the communities, they could actually profit and be empowered from living in this really rugged land. It was really wonderful to meet the Damara communities and just hear about the hope they have for how tourism in this harsh land is going to open their lives and their world. Later that day, we did finally find an elephant sharing a waterhole with a donkey. And suddenly I just had this deeper appreciation of, you know, why go all this way? Why Dummer Land? Yes, the scenery is stunning. This is a sunset picture I personally took, and I'm not a professional photographer, at Dummer Land camp on a sunset. And the scenery is just awesome. But what you really appreciate is that the humans and wildlife have found some kind of truce to live together in this harsh desert environment. And, you know, that kind of desert adaptation is what really makes Dummer Land so unique and special. So, yes, I get a little bit poetic when I talk about the Dummer Land, but it's just that weekend still sticks with me two decades later. It's changing my perspective forever. So getting to more than the integrity facts, maps, location. 
the Dumra land area is what we call colloquially a part of the Konena region. The Konena region is basically an entire northwest of Namibia, which includes the Konena River and Kooko land, the Skeleton Coast, and yes, the Dumra land. On the next slide, you'll see a much more specific Dumra land focused uh, picture. And what works really well in any Namibian safari is that you'll see Dumra land is kind of right in between Atosha and Swakopmund. It's a great gateway to the Skeleton Coast and back. And even though on this map it looks like the Dumraland area, which is kind of broadly circled in red, is close to the Skeleton Coast, note it's not at the Skeleton Coast. So the Dumraland area is something that really works well in linking an entire trip that highlights Etosha and Sossos, the Northwest, etc. And along the Dumraland, there are only specific lodges that we work with. I've highlighted the location on the map here, and I'll go into a little bit detail of each of them. There are many more camps and rest camps, but we are quite selective with who we use. So I highlighted in the stars the camps we use the most, and uh, including the more remote located Soros Soros and our personal who are under canvas. Now, what makes the Dumra land area so significantly interesting is that on this map you see it's just harsh desert rocks, a little bit of dunes, mountains, there's some hills and um you know, even our own table mountains. But it's these river systems, the Huab River, the Upper Huab River and the Uchab River, which are oases in this harsh area. And that's where you find your desert adaptive wildlife, like your elephants. And this is where the communities and wildlife eke a living off, because that's where the springs are. So despite what it looks like, this harsh, grim desert, these river systems are the lifeblood of what makes the Dumberland so unique. And this is where you see, for example, the location of the camps. They're all trying to be with an approximate location to the river systems because that's where the action's happening. Now, going into the specifics of why going there specifically, it is a landscape, absolutely without a doubt. Like I said, when I was there for the weekend, I saw one elephant, but the landscape was so beautiful. This is the landscape where giants are dwarfed. This is a typical scenery in the Jamra land. An elephant roaming the river systems, dwarfed by the magnificence of that landscape. There's a lot of volcanic rock in those kind of experiences. Now, one thing that I know a lot of other operators offer and we don't really do so much is that Jamra land has a lot of these local geological sites of interest, the Burnt Mountain, the Petrified Forest, and the organ pipes. Now, for Namibians, these geological sites are pretty interesting. For international travelers, less so, so they're quite underwhelming unless you are a geologist. We do take guests to the Twayful Fontaine petroglyphs, rock engravings, which is the World Heritage Site. But we don't really run around the entire Dumbran land just looking at rock formations because they're everywhere. So we want to really have guests a feel for the landscape and the wildlife and, yes, the history and geology of it all. But we very rarely, and it's very controversial, why don't we go there? Go to Burnt Mountain, which is just a black hill, or the organ pipes, which are these geological um, rocks that you, know, you can get anywhere in Dumberland, or the petrified forest, which are just a few old logs lying there. Again, I found them interesting because I'm a bit of a nerd, but then you also want to spend time dedicated to that. For us, it's landscape combined with desert adapted wildlife. This is the scenery where, I mean, I've been to the Dumberland back many, many times since those mid 90s when I was about 20 year old getting falling in love with rocks and elephants we have eco-friendly elephants in the Dumra land because you saw in that one map not a lot of vegetation those elephants know there's not a lot of trees so they better take care of them so they pull from the branches and the bark what they need to sustain themselves and they migrate on but unlike other African, um, African element, elephants, sorry, I'm stumbling over my words here, which are spoiled with big lush forests, they don't push them over, they don't break unnecessary branches off. I have seen large breeding herds of elephants since that one time I saw only the one lone bull. I've gone rhino tracking with Save the Rhino Trust. And it's that experience where you're surrounded by this desolate nature of, where you can't imagine anything living. And then you find not just wildlife, but big wildlife, megafauna, thriving in this landscape. 
and that's why you want to go there. Namibia has never been about wildlife sightings in the scope of Botswana and East Africa, but it's the unique wildlife sightings that you earn after hours traversing the most stunning landscapes. Of course, that gets now to the more factual stuff of the presentation, the camps. Um, like I said, we work only with a few selected camps. Camp Kepu is a personal favorite for the valued office. Surprisingly, it's one of the few lodges in the area that has air conditioning and um, for the price you pay, that's quite a big deal. And yes, the Dumberland gets quite warm. This is also a favorite on our ultimate Namibia, our scheduled departure, where guests stay. And it's the perfect base from which we go to the rock engravings. We go look for the elephants along the Abahuab River system. And the camp itself has a great sundown spot. The sister lodge to Camp Kipwe is the Moani Mountain Camp. It's a more luxury version of it all. Location is, has exactly the same benefit as Camp Kipwe, close to the rock engravings, close to the river system, looking for desert adapted wildlife. A stunning sundowner spot. Now, Moani Mountain Camp works well, well for individual travelers, honeymooners, small family groups, friends traveling together. The one thing that's always been a bit frustrating to work with is the many room types they have. And as you can see, they've got lots of different room types. So if you have a small group traveling in seven rooms and one person gets a standard view and the other one gets a superior view, they're all going to be disappointed. They all have some view, sure, but the superior view rooms have the best views. We like to book it if available. We have booked the mini suite and the mountain suite as well. They're the only two air-conditioned units of Mowani. But all in all, the Moani and Kipper portfolio offers great value, good location, and it is a personal favorite for Ultimate, especially on our guided and self-drive tours. Then, you know, good old D-Camp, as we so lovingly call the Dumbreland Camp. A lot has changed since I first visited it in the mid-90s when it was just a basic tented camp. It's now proper chalets. We've recently hosted quite a few operators and guests there. The feedback back has been consistently good. This camp is actually 100% owned by the Tora Conservancy. So Wilderness Safaris manages it, does the marketing, but ownership is 100% of the community. This is the proof of how conservancy tourism has enabled local communities to better their lives. They've built schools with it. They've been able to study with it, get jobs, hive jobs, you know, not just waitressing jobs. Two ladies from the communities have become area managers. One works for natural selection now. You know, really empowering. Um, here you two go drives looking for desert adapted elephants along the Huap River. Um, what's also great, what I personally enjoyed, is visiting the Tora Conservancy villages and meet the communities that benefit from this joint venture project. So this is continuously to be a personal favorite. It's a bit more expensive. And its location is too far for it to be a faithful Fontaine visit tour. They offer it as a three-night stay, but it is a bit of a long drive. You can always refer back to my map in the beginning. So it's a bit of a detour in that regard. The sister lodge of Dumra Land Camp is the Doronawas Lodge. Now, when you see the first picture, especially of the main area, everybody goes, oh, my goodness, that's Mordor of um, um, Lord of the Rings. Yes, the main area does look a bit um, awkward. The rooms, however, are actually beautiful. And the best part of all is you can roll your chalet, your bed, onto the veranda and sleep under the open stars. I mean, this is a no-brainer in the Dumberland. It rains little and predators are extremely shy. So this is the kind of camp where you can hang out outside as much as you want. So the chalets and rooms are absolute great value for money. And you forget over how awkward the main area is, which still has stunning views. It really works well. We mostly send it for small groups because it is quite heavily visited by groups. So, you know, it's also a bit larger than your average wilderness camp. So something to be aware of when you book Doronawas, that your honeymooners might feel a little bit lost at Doronawas. Then another lodge, which is just on the edge of what we call the traditional Dummer land, is the Grootberg Lodge. This is really mid-range lodge only. The location is good. We use it as a base to get more remote into the northwest. It has the most stunning views over the Grootberg Lodge mountain pass. We absolutely love the views. You can see by the rooms and also the price point, it is rich much more in the mid-market 
market basis. They cater more to the DBB self-drivers, comes in for a night, moves on. Having said that, they do offer elephant guided um, tracking and rhino tracking. Then you need two, three nights there because they have to cover huge areas to find them. We tend to book road bike lodge for groups for a base for a night before we go into the deeper part of Dummerland, but it definitely works for the price point they charge. On the opposite scale, on the complete opposite scale, is Soros Soros, one of the more expensive lodges in Namibia. It's part of the Namibia exclusive safaris portfolio. For some of you, you may know they've actually planned to open four lodges. Unfortunately, this is the only one that's opened. Um, the other one, Shea Shushana, Oma Tendeka, and Sumkua Kaudam Lodges are still unfortunately not opening. So this is currently the only ones opened. The rooms are very different to your typical African lodge, very Norwegian, Scandinavian, minimalistic style. The food is exceptionally good here, and it's all-inclusive, even French champagne. So unlike your typical all-inclusive lodge, which only includes local drinks, this goes next level. It has the stunning views over the Brandburg, but it's too far from the Treffelfontein rock engravings, but it's close to the Brandburg White Lady rock paintings. So that would be an option. The only problem we always had with Soros Soros is that for the price point, it doesn't offer much exclusivity because the Uchab River, which you can see in the distance on the top left side, a little bit greenery there, is also popular with self-drivers. There are a few campsites and rest camps along the way there. So it's very good likelihood that your high-end guests are going to share, this, share the same area with a budget 4x4 traveler with a roof tent. And we've always argued with them for the price point, you want to give some exclusivity or reduce it a little. We think it's a stunning lodge, but for us also the uniqueness of the experience is just as important as the actual aesthetics of a lodge. And then something very different, you know, well, how does Monty Python say it? And now for something completely different. Our under canvas camp, who up under canvas. Just a little background on our under canvas portfolio at Ultimate Safaris. We used to run these semi mobile tent camps in little dome tents for photographers and families. Nothing we really invested heavily on. And then there was more and more demand for exclusive set up tents. Now, we didn't want to set these tents up in public campsites because, again, what's the point if you share your campsite with the guy in the 4 by 4 roof tent? So we were actually approached by the Huap Conservancy, another joint venture community, who struggled to find lodges willing to open a lodge on their concession. Access was a problem, water was a problem. It just didn't work out for most lodge developers. And we were approached because we were just looking actually for a site to set up our tents. The second time we visited, actually when Tristan stayed over, he slept in the river system and a rhino walked past because the Huap Conservancy is custodians of rhinos, black rhinos, and work with Save the Rhino Trust on a Rhino Ranger pro program. Of course, we had to go pitch up camp there. You know, rhinos in the area, beautiful Dumberland, what can we not love? So beyond moving a simple dome tents, we actually did decide to develop a bit more infrastructure. We built a deck, built pitched our tents on there, um, had a little simple dining mess area, and in the first year, it was very casually done. We pitched the tent when guests arrived. If they didn't arrive, we'd have everything broken down, sent back to Vintook. Second year, we were running better, better operations. We had back-to-back -back guests, which means we didn't even to break down the tents each time and bring them back to Vintook. We got storage in there. Um, and now, you know, phase three, or was it phase four already? We've put proper beds in. We don't have camp beds anymore, not typical camping chairs. Uh, and it's becoming a pretty much a tented camp experience that sometimes reminds me of the early days of wilderness. We have flush toilets in all our tents and they all come with bucket showers. Now the bucket showers is an environmentally conscious situation. When we first pitched the camp there, we had to drive a few hours to the nearest water station, wait a couple of hours for the container to be filled with water and drive a few hours back to camp. So in other words, to fill up our water took us a full day. So, of course, we had to be economical with that. Since then, we've been able to drill for water points closer to camp. So, it's not a full day excursion anymore looking for water. But we've kept the bucket showers because, you know, this is environmentally sensitive area. Um, we are facing droughts. And there's enough hot water in the bucket shower for guests to suit them. We prepared flush toilets because actually environmentally, that's also better having a, a biodegradable septic tank. 
The whole point of these under canvas camps is exclusivity. A tailor-made experience hosted just for the way the guests want it. Dine when you want to. Families love it. So they can eat early. The kids can screech around and you know, have fun. Our guides really take kids out there and make it special for them. So unlike your typical lodge experience, which is wake up at 5, 5.30 breakfast, 6 o'clock go on activity, come back for lunch, there's spontaneity in an under canvas camp, which is set up exclusively for guests. So if it's two guests, they'll get the camp. If it's a generational family of grandmother and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, we set up the camp for that. And people love it. It's just so good to go into this unknown, spontaneous experience of what will happen, when it will happen. And of course, the highlight to this very special camp is, you know, beyond the, the standards of accommodation, which is essentially still a tented camp. You'll see bucket showers. Um, you'll see things on canvas. I think, Ted, you can go into the next slide. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, is that beyond that, it's the experience of rhino trekking privately with the company of Save the Rhino, Rhino Rangers. This experience is tailored for guests. The rhino rangers still go out every day doing their job. We, our guide, is in communication with them in the vehicle. If a rhino has been spotted, we meet up with the rhino rangers. And it's a really special experience because it's not a set lodge routine. There are no other guests. It's just you. Therefore, it's more children friendly because if there's a rhino camp, for example, they don't take kids under 16 on an activity. Um, rhino tracking and it's for safety reasons there is real concern about this um, kids can't walk far and you have a whole group of the other lodge people participating so who up on the canvas is this is for the family so of course you're not going to go rhino tracking with a toddler in the arm it's rough terrain but it's a really wonderful immersive experience for the family and you'll see that the theme here is get out get out at who up on the canvas we get out as much as we can we are on foot as much as we can. People demand it more. They spend hours getting to the camp or traveling around Namibia. And it feels good to stretch legs a bit. So based on the success of the canvas, we developed what we call our Stella Escape Sleepouts. This is really exciting because, again, it never rains in Namibia. And we were able to move into moving beyond just being in the car all day. Oh, by the way, it's just, this is a bit of nostalgia. The bottom is our uh, rental. Sorry, go back there, Ted. Um, I was going back and forth between the slides here. The bottom right left slide is the picture of the beast. In the early days of setting up for up on the canvas, we brought this kitchen car up. It fully catered for guests. Everything you need to know. The tents were on top, as you see. Geezer to fill up the hot water, the bucket showers. End of the tour, this car, the beast goes back, packed with all the things like that. Since then, we've got more of these kitchen cars. They're a little bit lighter. We've got Tinkerbell. We've got Gremlin, all catering to different group sizes. So we can still kind of semi-mobile cater to the camp, but moved on from it. And also, we've moved on from the original, very more rustic mobile camp feel. We just built a rock pool. We're still going to officially not launch this. Our operations manager just took the pitch out there. Now that we have more water drilled, we were able to pull, put a rock, rock pool in there which for those that know that Dharma land is quite appreciated in the heat of this day. But anyway, back to getting out of the car a bit more. So we've launched the Stella Escapes actually from Work Under Canvas, which means depending on guest fitness and interest, means that guests can go for an hour walk to the nearest sleep out or an extended hiking trail to the nearest sleep out. We have some points allocated to it. Again, because the camp is always set up exclusively, we can tailor for the sleep out when and where we want to. We have some spots which are wind protected. We generally keep the group small to six. Um, the Stella Escape is just a short walk to the nearest to the sleep out and next morning back. But the Huap Trails is an extensive two day, one night overnight hiking trail experience, fully guided. You don't carry any of your own stuff except your day pack. You know, we bring everything to the camp, fully catered. You arrive, fires burning, fireside dining. As you walk along the way, we do lemonade, lemonade stop surprises. We put in ice cream stops as a surprise. You're walking for a couple of hours and ta-da! 
in the middle of the desert. There's some ice cream spots. Our operations team, of course, hates us for it, trying to keep that ice cream cool just in time for when guests arrive. But who up on the canvas has become our walking camp? It has become the camp where families, honeymooners, guests have tailored experiences for them to get out and really themselves get dwarfed by the landscapes. And that is just all the highlights of the Dumra land. I'm surprised I didn't rant on for two or three hours about this. And where we can, when people ask, you know, what, where do you go in Namibia? We say, sure, Tasha, everybody talks about it. Sure, Sausage the Dunes. But the Dumra land is just something. It's like the home to my soul. And we always say to people, but where can you see that? And we go, just go there. Trust me, you'll love it. We are so in love with this area that's a little sneak peek. We are possibly developing yet another camp in the area. More to be revealed with time. But this is the area where our heart sits, the staff's heart sits. This is where we develop more. And this is where we want to bring back because this is where we see conservation in action. Human communities benefiting from life, wildlife conservation, wildlife thriving in an area that really on the surface shouldn't sustain any life. So thank you everybody that came in and listened to whatever time zone you are in. Evening for me, some for you in the morning, some others for midday. And some of you may only hear the recording afterwards. Thank you again for listening in. Thank you, Birgit. Absolutely, absolutely love it. Um, incredible photos and um, really gave a sense of the experience in, in Damarland. We've got a couple of questions um, just to round things out here and wrap things up. Um, uh, seasons in Damarland. Can you talk about um, the different seasons and, and what may be different? Um, and if there is certain seasons that you um, really can't visit or should, wouldn't recommend you visiting. Know, it isn't because it's low rainfall year round generally. Um, January is hot. January, February is hot. There's, you know, the rocks baking in the sunshine, you know. So, it, you know, on the canvas camps, for example, we've actually closed then annually from December through to March it also gives our team a break and we repair anything we need to repair on the under canvas. So we generally, generally keep it um, close then. But like I said, keep where in Moani have air conditioned units, you know, the elephant wildlife, it depends on rainy season as with anything in the movie is never guaranteed. Um, so it is actually the one area where we confidently say year round, you will love it. And how many nights, would you recommend in Damar land in general? Oh, minimum two nights, absolutely. If you want to do more like the up on the canvas, three nights to go hiking trails. Um, it works well in combination with maybe Skeleton Coast or the Northwest. So you can easily have like this amazing Northwest experience of two nights Damar land, two nights Skeleton Coast and two nights Konina region like Sarah Kafima. And then you will absolutely have your mind blown away by those three areas, all part of the Northwest. And in my next presentation will be about the Kaoko land and Skeleton Coast. And it also works well as two or three nights in between uh, Swakamund and, and Atosha ge geographically, yes. especially Absolutely. if you're doing a driving, driving safari. Absolutely, without a doubt. And then I think maybe our last question is, uh, which lodges offer rhino, desert adapted rhino tracking? Obviously, Huab under canvas, um, but which are the others that you presented on today? Uh, only desert rhino camp. When you're talking, well, it depends. Hrutbeck also offers it. Um, and you know, when we're talking rhino tracking, we're talking the ones with say, the Rhino Trust rhino ranges. You know, there are rhinos in the entire area, so you might come across one. But the engagement, Save the Rhino Trust was first involved at Palmbach at Desert Rhino Camp. And that's where the first original rhino tracking has happened. Um, you have a good success rate there as well. Grootburg, they offer it, but the success rate is quite slim. There's huge areas they have to cover. And then Huab on a canvas, because it's exclusively privately arranged, has good success rate as well, because you're not limited to a lodge schedule. One guest in your group is tired and now the rest of the group has to disappear you know and this is usually friends and family traveling to who up on the canvas excellent okay thank you Birgit I think that's all the questions for today um, we will be sending out a link to this recording as well so look out for that as well as some follow-up information on uh, some of the properties and the region that um, the Damarland region which Birgit uh, 
discuss today. And thank you for staying late at the office and, and giving us this, uh, <laughs> letting us dream a little bit about uh, being in Damarland. And we'll um, be in touch as well about the next uh, of our number five in our deep dive series, which as Birgit mentioned, will be the Coca Land, which we'll be doing sometime in the next couple of uh, weeks or months to be determined. Yeah. Thank you so much, Birgit. <laughs> Have a fun. good rest of the Thank evening. You, <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.